Hey, hey, look who's back. Hey, let me see a bit of water before we're going to start and boom welcome back welcome back to our second part of this 10 years journey i was a fresh 20 years old when i first left my little bubble it was a 2012 and right now i'm about to go to india it is 2014 and i'm 22 years old but first back to the hammock the reason that brought me towards that environment was not only the book siddhartha but was also the fact that out of all the places that were heavily colonized around the world, India was maybe the only one that truthfully, largely, also on a national level, managed to preserve its own way, as in spiritual beliefs, clothing, language. India was something that always attracted me somehow. On top of it, in this journey, I already heard so much about yoga, about meditation, but I always heard of it from an Eurocentric perspective. What are these paths? from the actual indigenous original perspective. And on top of it, I was often talking and thinking about the Western problematics, exploitation here, racism on this side, there's oppression on the other side, thinking about it, talking about it, but always within that Western context. How much I knew about Western problems, but what did I know about living outside of a Western context? So that's why also for me, that chapter towards India was very important, was me going, outside of the Western bubble. Not only my own bubble within the Western context has been broken right now, I was trying to break my own Western bubble. This was enough for me to actually let me say, okay, let me go towards India. One thing that I did when I was on the hammock was already to detach from a lot of things. And one of those were money. I was still working and getting paid, of course, but my way to get to detach from it was to not count how much money was in the envelope. They were paying me by cash. Whatever they were giving me, I was taking it, placing it under the rock that was functioning as a step for me in order to go on top of the hammock. This is how detached I managed to become. I was not fearful. In the end of the day, I was living a life where I didn't need to pay rent. Also in the context, I was not in need to pay food because I was eating from the restaurant. So I never touched those money. I wanted to go to India, so it was time for me to see if the money were still there, first of all, and if yes, how much. So... I counted whatever was in the envelope and there was definitely more than enough for me to go to India and to afford whatever I needed to afford. Another important thing that I wanted to detach from was belongings. When I went to India, I decided to bring a little backpack. Inside the backpack, there was literally a blanket that I got from the airplane, a bottle of water that I also got from the airplane, a book with empty pages, a pen, the passport, the phone, and $2,000 in a plastic envelope that I brought with me just in case. As for clothing, I decided to bring only whatever I was wearing, which was a jumper, a pair of trousers, a pair of socks, and a pair of shoes. That's it. What about a tent? Not even a tent. Well, shall I at least book a hostel in advance so I know where to go? Not even that one. I didn't book anything. I decided to just literally dive myself into the new, almost naked. And my hope was that, that by going there naked, I could actually get dressed metaphorically and also physically. So I was ready to go for it. Next things I know, I'm ready to go to India. I remember arriving in Delhi, already facing so much difference and going around so many sounds, so many colors, so many, ah, so, so many smells and was like something I was so excited to be already involved in. But that was not my final destination. I just spent some hours in Delhi uh, while I was kind of waiting for my actual final flight that was bringing me to the northern part of India, a region called Uttarakhand, also translatable as the land of the gods. I didn't have anything booked, anything organized, but right before I left, I did some little researches and I had an idea. The idea was to land at the airport and then reaching this holy town called Rishikesh, there would have been about one day walk. Exciting about this walk was that it was going through a jungle where some unknown species to me were actually taking place. Monkeys, leopard, elephants. So I was like, let me go through it. Let me walk and arrive to this holy city by going through this challenge. What I didn't consider was that once I landed to my final destination it was already night. So with the darkness, I decided to wait for the morning before going towards this journey that could have been also a little bit dangerous, of course. I just found a nice corner where to sleep in the airport and all of a sudden some of the police member of the airport approached me. We was not speaking a good English and my Hindi of course was unexistent, but I managed to understand that the airport was domestic, therefore it was closing and I was not able to sleep there. But he told me that some of his co-workers were leaving with their bikes and they were going to a town where I could have found 
a taxi in order to go to another city called Deradun where I could have actually found a guest house. I accept his offer, I jump on the scooter and these random guys just started driving me in the middle of the darkness and I was so excited, I was like wow the adventure starts, let's go. <laughs> they actually dropped me into this uh, sort of um, town slash village and uh, they they couldn't speak English whatsoever and they just dropped me there and smiled at me and left. And so I was like, okay, where am I? It was a sort of main road with a few shops here and there, but I couldn't really locate myself where I was. Also, I didn't have internet on my phone, trying to understand if there were actually any taxis or not. But I seen a man that was just about to go on his car. And I asked him, hey, can you give me a lift to Deradun, the city where I could find a guest house? And he says, I, can, I cannot give you a lift all the way to Deradun, but I can give you a lift to the bus station. And from there you could find the bus going to Deradun. He actually gave me a lift to the bus station and was such a nice guy. His name was Rahul. And this guy was speaking a very good English and turns out also to be the same age as myself. So as the ride was going, it was a very short ride, but we started to connect to each other. He was very curious, of course, about who I was. I was very curious about who he was. And so we exchanged a lot, even though the brief ride. I say goodbye to him, but he also went outside of his own car. And he said, oh, let me make sure that at least you are taking the bus and that because it's late night I'm not sure if the bus will come and I felt really so cared I was like oh wow this stranger is going towards the extra mile in order to make sure that I'm gonna be fine it was so nice to receive this treatment we were waiting for the bus and we were talking 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 next things we know it was one o'clock and there were no buses so he said well what do you need to do in Deradun? I said, I need to find a place where to sleep. And he said, there's actually a guest house also in this village. So he kindly brought me to this guest house, but they wanted to have a photocopy of my passport. At the time, to find a place where to do a photocopy was virtually impossible. But he decided to still try. So we went to various shops, but of course they were closed. While we were going, looking for this photocopy, he started to ask me, but did you eat? It's been already some hours. You're coming from a long journey from Australia. You didn't even eat. I was like, did you ever eat any Indian food? I said, no, I just arrived. I was like, come on, come with me. It brought me to a sort of restaurant that was on the street. Actually, a restaurant that belonged to some of his friends. It was such a beautiful, spicy food that I never tasted in my whole life. It was full on of taste. I was trying to pay. And of course, I was about to pay uh, for my meal, at least. He stopped me. He said, no, 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 with a very serious face. And I was like, oh, what? He said, please. This is my duty, this is my honor. The way he did it, to me, was something really unheard. To my 22 years old boy, I never ever experienced something like that, especially coming from Western context, a stranger. that is not only giving me a lift to the bus station, but he's waiting for me, he's trying to help me out in order to find a guest house. Then he asks me if I'm hungry. I'm actually hungry. He actually brings me to the place and he's even paying for my own food. I'm like, where did I end up? Where is the trick right here? Where, 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 where is the camera? I was like, where is the camera? You know, I was like, what's going on? I was very overwhelmed by his kindness. Literally, I could feel his realness. It was like so beautiful. Next thing we know, we're going to take some juice. And then it was almost natural. And oh, I knew that he was about to ask me that. And he knew that I would have said yes. And he goes like, well, if it's just a place where you need to go to sleep, why don't you just come to my place? My father is there. Tomorrow morning, you can also get to know him since you are very curious about our culture. Just come. I felt so incredibly honored to receive such invitation. My heart was completely trusting, but my mind was a bit, mm, I'm not sure. Yet, I felt to accept the invitation. Again on the car, and we went outside of the main road, and we went into a very dark area. So we drive in this dark area, so I couldn't see anything else than whatever the car was pointing at. We go and we go and we drive in for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Next thing I know, in the middle of, a, of an empty field, he turns the car. And my heart was like, wait, what? As he turns the car in the middle of an empty field, I can see a house. And I was like, ah, okay, okay, I think there is something here. So we went outside of the car and I was like, yeah, so this is my house, this is my area. And to be honest, there was nothing I could be scared of. There was nothing I could be scared of. The energy of this man was just so pure. There was no way there was, he would have done something to me. There was no way. And I could feel it deep in my heart. And as soon as we parked the car, also whatever slight fear was still in my mind just disappeared. We went inside the house and he turned on the light and it was a very beautiful, fresh, cozy home. And the first thing he did, he was like, let me introduce you to my father. And I was like, oh, please, please, let him, let him sleep. Don't, don't, don't disturb me because of me, please. He was like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Baba, Baba, he woke him up. And I was like, so this is Joshua, this is my friend. He was curled up on his bed. And he looked at me 
He gave me such a pure smile, pure smile. He gave me his greetings. And I felt so welcome just by the little tiny action that he dropped. He woke up with a smile by looking as complete stranger that most likely was looking like an alien within that environment, within that context. To me, it was something like, wow, I felt incredibly accepted in a place that I never belonged to. We go into Rahul's bedroom and he says, this is where we're gonna sleep. This is also your room today. But we kept on talking, talking. We were curious about each other. He was curious about me coming from a Western context and the travels that so far I had. And I was super curious about himself, the culture where he lives, the person that he is, the family that he has. So all of it kept us awake for hours until maybe 5 a.m. Until eventually we fell asleep. I woke up in the morning with a smell. And it was the fragrance of the tea that Rahul's father was cooking. I woke up and his father started to speak to me in Hindi. And he was like, Pini chai? Chai pini? I didn't understand what he meant, but Rahul saw it. I was a bit confused. He was like, he made some teas for you. So he wants to know if you want to drink it. I was like, of course, of course, yes. So he gave me this tea. I never had such a spiceful, full body, literally full body cup of tea. It was like a next level cup of tea. It was like ah whoa what is this like i was i never i never associate tea to something so tasty and raul was like let me show you outside yesterday it was night and you couldn't see anything so we went outside his little garden and then he brought me up to the stairs he was living in one of those classic indian flat roof and then for the first time i could actually see india ah wow the temple in front of the house the greeneries, the fields, the other little house around, the birds flying, the banana trees, and the Himalayas on the distance. It was such a view, it was such a heartfelt welcoming that to be honest, I never felt in my whole life. I never felt in my whole life. But we kept on talking and talking and everything was so smoothly natural. And the vibe, the heat in the meantime, the freshness of the hair was something that was allowing us to flow within the rhythm. And at some point during the talks, I, I could hear. I, I started to be conscious about it. I was like, I can keep hearing a music, but where is it from? Was the, the same music was actually there the night before. And I asked him, is, is a club nearby and why they kept on going in the morning also in this afternoon? And he was like, oh no, it's not a club, it's a wedding. I was like, See, your wedding are lasting for days. And I was very curious, I asked a lot about it. And then he was like, maybe we can try to go there. And I was like, oh, do you know them? And he goes like, oh no. And I was like, how can we just show up in somebody else's wedding and just be part of it? But we still went there. And before we actually enter into the party, I will talk to the family, to the groom, to the bride, explaining the situation and who I was also and why it was good for me to be there. Next thing we know, we were there dancing, dancing, enjoying, celebrating with the whole family, celebrating with the whole group, full of enjoyment and so much joy, so much joy and a hype. We felt so different than any wedding that I ever seen and witnessed in a Western context that was much more black and white, literally. Over there, nothing was black and white. Everything was just an explosion of colors, of movements, of sounds, of voices of fragrances, of ceremonies, of rituals, of incense, was something so incredibly beautiful to witness. And of course, people were watching me, watching me, watching me, wondering who is this alien coming from who knows which planet. But also I was used to the kind of look. Also in Italy, people were looking at me when I was going certain places. So I was kind of used to it. At least the kind of look was not like a, what are you doing here? It was more like a, oh wow, what are you doing here? It was a different kind of vibe that I received. So I, I embraced it. I must say, after the dance, people were even more close to me because they could see also myself able to enjoy and not just to be there stuck in the mud, but was able also to express. And I think that's what resonated with the people at the party. And eventually we managed all together to enjoy. The food was self-service. Anybody could have gone there and take whatever they wanted to take. Yet people were still coming to me and offering me food. Oh, take this. Oh, take that. Take this. And Rahul, I remember, was super concerned. And Rahul was so kind. He was afraid I was getting a stomach upset. And he was asking me, did you eat this type of food before? I was like, no. So I was like, so take it easy. Take it easy. He was keep saying, take it easy. Take it easy. And I was like, oh, don't worry. We'll be fine. Boom, 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 boom. I was taking whatever people was offering. Boom, 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 boom. Next thing I know, diarrhea. Boom. And it was not such a severe diarrhea. I was okay. I managed. But uh, this also showed the actual truthful care. Of, uh, of Rahul, literally a brother from another mother.
talking about mother i asked raul where is your mother and it was like he's in delhi with my sister she will come to the house in a few days at the stage it was kind of obvious that rahul wanted me there and myself i was really enjoying being there you know not on a, on a touristic level you know going and see something and but literally being part of stuff was something for me very precious that i really valued a lot and naturally stayed there for other few days and then uh, i met the mother the mother was such a powerful individual, super strong woman and was so kind, so kind. Every morning waking up, doing her pujas, giving the offering to the gods and also being introduced to a whole different way, to a whole different culture, to a whole different way of seeing um, the spiritual life. It was so refreshing coming from a Western context that is all about, once again, black and white, good and evil. And now meeting up a spiritual culture that was also going beyond my religion is better than yours. This was something very incredibly refreshing, very incredibly needed also to absorb. One thing that I remember also doing with the, with the Jagdemba, Raul's mother, was uh, to take care of the garden. Every other morning she was uh, taking care of the garden, making sure that the garlic was clean, making sure the roses were growing, her lentils were growing. So I remember going through some days of working with her, of cleaning the garden, from the extra grass, harvesting the lentils, or harvesting the berries. And every time was such a blessing. It was also so beautiful to be able to sit down next to an elderly person without the need of talking. As for Raul's mother was not speaking English, my Hindi, I must say, was coming, small, small, tara, tara, it was coming, but uh, it was still very hard, you know, but I, I was managing small, small, and it was so beautiful to just be able to sit down and not feeling the awkwardness of, oh, we need to talk about something. No, we could just sit down and embrace each other in the holiness of silence. And this was something beautiful that was often happening with elderly people. It was something that I incredibly enjoyed a lot. Also another beautiful part, uh, something that I loved about Rahul's mother was that every now and then randomly, randomly, she was just all of a sudden pointing something and calling me, just, just, just. <laughs> and then just tell me the respective name in Hindi of that items that she was pointing just for the sake of me to learn because she was like, you need to learn Hindi so you can express yourself with other people, you know? And there was, there was such an act of love and kindness. But when it comes to love and kindness, I must mention Rahul's father. Not only the teas that he was dropping in the morning, afternoon and evening, but also I learned so much from his silence. He was a man that was speaking very rarely but when he was speaking was because it was needed, was because it was a serious matter, it was because it was wise. And that's what I loved about the man, about Uncle G, about Kepa Singh, was his wisdom. Also, he was not speaking in English, but who was often translating and was something um, I learned so much from, from Raul's parents, but also from Rahul. He was not somebody that was like, hey, listen to me, I'm having something to teach. Just the way he was speaking, it was so much wisdom. But of course, we were joking, we were having a lot of fun, but also there was always the baseline of wisdom that I learned so much from. I saw the tradition, I saw the ancient ways, I saw a ways that is fading more and more away because of westernization that is taking over each corner of the world. I'm wondering how can we let this wisdom, these ancient ways, this depth going away in front of our eyes? There's no way. And us, as the upcoming leading generation, we have the duty to hold on, to keep these very precious ways alive. Okay, some people are going through modernization, fair enough. But at least let's not forget our roots, because what is a tree without its roots? How can we grow? How can we lead? How can we be without our roots? On top of it, of course, I was going also to the local temple, embracing also a way that was for me almost of a taboo, coming from the Western environment approaching different beliefs there's always something in the mind that goes a bit like hmm, i shouldn't do that but eventually i needed to break down all those limitations in order to break that glass that wouldn't allow me to absorb the beauty of life the beauty of the spiritual journeys that can express itself in so many different ways as krishnamurti used to say spiritual beliefs are just like rivers that are ending up all in the same ocean the beloved one it definitely was so refreshing especially coming from that white jesus culture Nothing against Jesus, but a lot against how the colonizer abused the story of Jesus in order to take over the whole world, not only with weapons, but also with religion. That's also why I was so attracted to a place like India in the first place, because 
even though the colonization managed still to preserve its indigenous beliefs on also on a very numerical level stuff that is quite rare to be found all around the world and most of these beliefs have been uh, satanized or completely distorted by eurocentric view so going back to a belief that was pure in its soul form there was nothing wrong actually there was so much beauty to embrace within the shape culture and reality of their way of approaching life just the way we were greeting each other in that context namaste i salute i greet the divine within you i mean can you imagine how deep is just just it's not hello ciao no no i salute the divine within you how deep is that this is how you greet a stranger let's sing this for a second Eventually, I then discovered that all, all indigenous beliefs were having the same ground, the same basement, having the same foundation of nature, of rituals and community. And that's what I could still experience in the place like where I was. I later on discovered through researches, readings and cultural exchanges that the main ancient Indian beliefs are having a lot of strict correlation to the ancient Egypt belief. Ancient Egypt, the home of civilization for the whole world and also for Africa. Indeed, we as a kind of Ghana apparently migrated from ancient Egypt. But this is another story that we will touch eventually later on. Let's go back to India. I remember one time Rahul was like, oh, let's go out. It was evening and Rahul was like, oh, why tonight some of my friends will come here and we're going to go out. So I was expecting a night at the bar, a night at the pub, a night at the club. But where we went to was a local veggie market. And it was so beautiful, it was so pure. There was no drinking involved. There was just this nice, kind walk in the darkness, but it was lighted up by the various candles of the various market women and market men selling their veggies. It was so, it was so cozy. It felt also so ancient to walk on that little market. And, and I remember at some point during this market night, one of Raul's friends all of a sudden stopped, looks at me, and he didn't know a lot of English. But he knew something, and he goes like, in our culture, guesses are gods. You are a who guest, meaning that you are my guest, meaning that you are my god. I was like, I was, I was like, what? Like, literally, my heart was crying. I'm coming from a culture of Milan where there is a saying, l'ospite puzza dopo tre giorni, which literally means the guest starts to smell after three days. Meaning that you are, you are welcome in my house, but after three days, you know, get out of here. I was already there for about a week. Not, not only I haven't been told to get out, not only I have been told to keep on staying, but also I've been told that I'm their God. I'm like, what is going on? Where did I end up? I was like, where did I end up? I never felt so accepted in my whole life. In my whole life, I never felt so accepted. And coming to a land, to a complete strange land with virtually no belongings and arriving and meeting somebody that welcomes me so much in his own house, with his own family, in, with his own friends and all of these members are welcoming literally from the bottom of their heart was for me something, something I cannot even describe, something I cannot even describe. Rahul never wanted to have not even one rupee from me, not even one rupee. Sometimes. I remember also going through some fight because I was like, let me pay for it. And he was like, no, you can't, you shouldn't. So that's how genuine his heart was. Days kept on going. And then at some point I started to talk about Rishikesh, that I was willing to go there, it was my actual destination. And I was like, okay, but wait, before you go into Rishikesh, wait, stay here at least until holiday. Holiday is a big festival in the whole of India and it's a holy day indeed where the people throwing colors and doing pujas attracting all the new and best energy for an upcoming journey. He was like, at least you need to stay here for holidays. My cousins from Delhi will come here, we'll go to different places. We can have a whole day together. And then from there, if you want, you can go. Holiday was about two weeks after I arrived in Rahul's house. I was like, of course. A holiday arrived, his cousins arrived, was a whole energy, was a whole energy. We drove in many different places. We were rafting also. We were also dancing in different rivers. It was a very genuine uh, exchange that we all had. After that, his cousin went back to Delhi and was still me, Rahul, and his family. Also, I remember yeah, meeting up with uh, other people around the village, chilling with them, working with them, learning about mensary and construction. It was definitely a very beautiful experience that kept me there all together. 
the days passed, the weeks passed, and then I stayed with Rahul for two months, two months in this house, like from a complete stranger, this man became truthfully my brother from another mother, they're also the mothers, actually my mother, you know, it was a whole thing. And then one day, just as all of a sudden, I arrived in Rahul's house, and so all of a sudden, I must have gone out. I remember one morning, waking up, and feeling like, okay, it's time for me to go. I went to Rahul, and I said, Rahul, I will go today. And he was kind of shocked, but in the meantime, he knew it. He knew it that the day would have come. And uh, why did I go? I felt, I felt at the stage that I absorbed all that I could absorb from Rahul, from his family, from his context. And to be honest, my thirst for knowledge was still too high. I still needed to learn much more. I still needed to, to absorb much more. So Rahul was definitely my, my family chapter, my acceptance chapter. It was a chapter that I could never forget and a chapter that I was always going to bring inevitably with me within my heart, regardless what. But on that day, on that period of my life, I felt that it was time for me to say goodbye to Rahul, to his mother, to his father. It was emotional. I was crying, yet it was needed. They, they knew that I needed to go. I knew that I needed to go. So there was not something so rational, to be honest, that can be explained. I only knew that it was time for me to go. I, so I started to walk. I went to the main road, jumped on the Tok Tok. And uh, yes, the next things I know, a new chapter is ahead. That book that I read about Siddhartha, was uh, saying something that touched me a lot, which was uh, goals are very important, but also incredibly dangerous. Because when somebody has a goal, he tends to concentrate all his attention to that goal. It just doesn't allow that individual to absorb whatever is on the path towards that goal. That's what I practiced when I first arrived in India, when I first arrived in Uttarakhand, was uh, not to attach to a goal, not to have a goal. So Rishikesh was my destination but was more than a goal was more of an idea and idea are like clouds they are changing shapes every time so this approach allowed me to truthfully absorb whatever was on the way to the Rishikesh yet the talk talk that I was on was having Rishikesh as its last destination this was where I was ending up this time I was going to Rishikesh to embrace the apparently the home of yoga I was looking for a place where to sleep and then I find this beautiful rock next to the Holy Ganga, a holy river that finds its origin on top of the Himalayas that flows in a big part of India. Many people are doing pilgrimage in order to arrive there. I settled myself next to the Holy River. On the very stage of the river, the water was very clean. I was relying from the water all together. I was bathing in the river every morning, the freshness of the water. I was uh, drinking from the river, I was relying on the water, and that area became for me a very sacred place. One thing that I discovered are the sadhus or the so-called babas. Who are the sadhus? Who are the babas? They can be called monks in movement. Literally people that left all their conventional life behind. Belongings, family, identity. They left everything behind in order to pursue the path of enlightenment, in order to find the union with the ultimate truth, the beloved one. God, Allah, Brahma, Krishna, you call it how you want it, to reconnect to the source of life, that it is literally the path of yoga. And that's what I didn't know. I got to discover that yoga is much more than a, a few physical stretches or a few breathing exercises. Whatever it is done on the context is actually done in order to reach the final stage of samadhi that eventually will lead an individual to enlightenment. And it is something that goes actually very far away from physical health or whatever goes on in the West with the yoga pants and yoga mats and all the kind of business that surrounded it. And this was actually happened also to Rishikesh. After especially the Beatles ended up going there a little while ago, tourism invaded the Holy City and a lot of um, yoga school got created just as bakeries pretty much. I went to some of these yoga schools but it was quite clear that some of these schools were more centered into giving people that at times were Westerners whatever they could translate in their home instead of giving the actual yogic path that of course cannot inevitably be translated into a western context into a consumeristic context into a superficial context but i had the chance also to meet up privately some of these monks some of these babas sometimes just because inevitably i was living like them i was sleeping in the open sleeping next to the ganga i was sleeping in the forest where by the way also cobra various snakes spiders and monkeys were just hanging by then i i went to a different level my mind was not worrying me anymore i was 
very much grounded within the beauty of earth. I remember also waking up one morning with Ababa just staring at me and I was like, like hello. We start talking, spiritual, philosophical exchanges. It was uh, something very beautiful to talk on that level, to be fulfilled by these people's knowledge. It was so much wisdom, so much wisdom that was for me incredible. At some point I could feel that Rishikesh was a bit too tight for me. Also with tourism, it was nice to also exchange with Westerners, but uh, once again, I felt that it became a bit too tight for me. So I started to ask around, where could I find a place where it was more of a pure and ancient knowledge, wisdom exchange. And somebody directed me to a cave that was um, reachable only by walk, after days of walk. So next things I know, boom, I started to walk. I don't know in which circumstance I was ending up. And next things I know, Boom, my family invites me to go with them, to eat with them, and to have actually a whole party because there was a birth celebration going on. And then I keep on walking and then uh, looking for this cave, asking people, follow the direction of the rock, you turn right at the waterfall, you keep going straight. And so eventually I ended up in this ashram. For those who don't know, an ashram is a temple that generally also has accommodation. It was actually the ashram that was connected to the cave where other monks were dwelling. So I just started to stay in the ashram and learning so much about yoga asanas, pranayama, chat karma, various limbs of the path of yoga, not the whole of it, were just various limbs of the path of yoga that would allow, once again, somebody to reach the perfect stage of samadhi. On top of it also, learning a lot about self-sustainability because an actual yogi should live in certain ways, the way the house should look like, the way the house should be plastered. I learned that is a path very much connected to nature indeed. And I remember also being very much part of that uh, natural process as collecting firewood, uh, cooking, helping building some stairs that we needed to build, also plastering the whole floor with cow dung, a lot of techniques that I was not aware of. And that experience literally allowed me also to learn. Until the point I realized that that place was not the place that was connected to those caves whatsoever. It was actually still very far. And uh, but I ended up spending there a week or two weeks from there, I kept on going towards my, my actually journey towards these caves. And uh, eventually I found these caves. So there were two caves. One was called Shiva Gufa, another one was called Ganesh Gufa. So as for Shiva Gufa, it was a bigger cave with also different compartments of caves, all natural caves. There were about three or four monks living in there. All of them decided to walk the path of silence. They were doing pujas every morning, smoking a lot of weed. It was also very interesting to see how hemp and marijuana was just growing everywhere. As for me, I was not into smoking, but I was definitely willing to learn more about their ways and their meditation techniques, and also simply their lifestyle. It was fascinating me so much. The only thing about that particular cave is that a lot of pilgrimage were going on, so it was a bit more of a busy cave. So after a little while, I decided to keep on walking and looking for the other cave, Ganesh Gufa. And it was about an hour walking from that cave, the more crowded cave. Contrary, this cave was completely quiet. There was one man, only one man living in this cave. It was an old man, around 60, 70 years old, incredibly fit. He was the only custodian of the cave. Also, this man decided not to talk. So once I arrived there, he just saw me and I saw him. And he dropped me the namaste without talking. And then the first thing he did so I went there and he offered me some food. I ate the roti with a nice sabji, strict vegetarian diet, of course. And then we were just sitting, contemplating the beauty of the environment. This particular cave, contrary to the other one, was actually facing a big valley. We could see the monkeys jumping, we could hear the screams of leopard. It was such a beautiful, incredible environment. And then the evening arrived. He saw me still there. So. He prepared rice and he was like, so I ate the food. And then the night arrived, he saw me there. He went to his guard room. There was a simple box. What did he take out? Two blankets. One he gave it to me, another one he kept for himself. We fell asleep. This kept on going, this rhythm, this harmony, kept on going for about five days. That was our life, sitting, and contemplating the beauty of nature, the beauty of the Thai self, the beauty of the unity, the beauty of the oneness, the beauty of God. It was such a, I cannot really describe that experience. I can only share as much. While I was on the cave, I felt that 
it was time for me to leave India. I was so fulfilled that I was like, okay, it's time for me to leave India. Three months has passed since I arrived in Uttarakhand. And um, next things I know, I walked all the way back to Rishikesh and I heard uh, by talking with different people that there were some very, very, very cheap flights going from Kolkata to Thailand. What attracted me about Thailand was martial art. My passion was still on, not to become a fighter, but just to open up my mind even more through the challenges of the body. So there was no particular reason, but I felt I felt called to go there. So next things I know, I take in a train that was bringing me all the way to Kolkata, a 72 hours train, a whole adventure. I was literally having no seat, sitting on the stairs of the train, facing the openness, almost falling down. And then somebody stole my phone. And then I was jumping out of the train. It was just insane. Going back in the train it was, it was a whole adventure that I'm not here explaining right now. It would take too long. But what I wanted to say is that uh, I arrived in Kolkata safe, without phone, but safe. From there, I took my flight that eventually brought me to Thailand, to an island called Phuket Island. I discovered it was incredibly touristy, a huge amount of Westerner there. And coming from the Indian environment, I was so overwhelmed. But there were some serious Muay Thai gyms with incredible, super experienced teachers. So I ended up there for about a week, training, sharpening up my skills. Money-wise, I still had about $1,000. What I didn't expect was the week training was actually very expensive because that island was very, very pumped up by tourism. Also, I decided to buy another second hand phone. And this also brought my foundings lower, but still manageable. Especially in those days, I was very much detached from money. I knew I could do stuff without it. But in the meantime, I was you know, welcoming some extra founding. So my attention started to go to Aotearoa, nowadays known as New Zealand. Go figure. Another place that's been heavily colonized, yet there was preserving such a strong, amazing and deep culture, the Maori culture. I met a lot of people from Aotearoa while I was in Australia, and uh, I've been told about the extreme beauty of those islands. And for me, it was like, wow, I was very impressed to hear that. So on top of it, in just like Australia, having a visa that will allow me to stay for one year while having the right to also work for one year. The beauty, the Maori culture, on top of the fact that I could have the possibility to gain some monetary found was enough for me to leave and find my way. Now, there was only one problem. I was not expecting the flight to be so expensive. So this made me land with literally 50 New Zealand dollars. Well, by then I was already in the game. I was not fearful about it. And so here I am once again alone, starting over from zero with no money, trying to life will tell. So that's what I'm going to bring you with the next upcoming episode. So far, don't forget to turn on your notification for the next part. Don't forget to subscribe and of course to share it. Share it with whoever you feel like. So far, I catch you later.